Namaste, Swagatam, Vanakkam, Namaskaram. It is a great pleasure to be with all of you and share today's talk on the history of yoga from ancient to modern times. I begin this session with an invocation to the timeless Guru Parampara, the timeless lineage of teachers, the great masters, who have enabled us to be recipients of this amazing wisdom, the wisdom of life, the wisdom of yoga. Om Tadvaram Paryaya Vidmahe Jnana Lingeshwaraya Dhimahe Tanno Guru Prachodayate Om Om Yoga Maharshi Dr. Swami Gita Ananda Giri Guru Maharaj Ki Jai When we talk about the history of yoga, we are talking about something that is indeed timeless. There is always a debate. When did yoga start? What was the origin of yoga? Well, the very moment that the universe was created, yoga came into existence. Because the concept of yoga is one of regaining our universal nature. That universal nature that we have forgotten because of the ignorance called avidhya. And because of the ignorance, we move away from that oneness with the universe. And hence, we have a sense of duality. This duality called dvaitam breeds fear and the survival instinct. Hence, the movement away from a duality, a state of separation, back to a state of oneness. A state of integrated wholesomeness is what 
yoga is all about. This is why we find the term Hiranya Garpa Yoga. And everybody thinks it is some great sage called Hiranya Garpa who founded yoga. Actually, what it means is Hiranya Garbha, the golden bioplasm of life itself. So, the origin of yoga is tied into the origin of life itself, Hiranya Garbha. What do we mean by yoga? We mean the art and science that enables us to move from a sense of separatedness, two-ness, duality, dichotomy, back to our original nature of oneness, which is a state of ease, sukham, a state where we manifest sat chit anandam, sat that highest reality, chit the highest consciousness, and anandam the highest bliss. The highest reality, the highest consciousness, the highest bliss, that is what we are. But we have moved away from it. Hence, yoga is the process of going back home. Sweet Om. You will notice that Om, O-M, lies in the middle of H-O-M-E. We are going back to that state where we are at home. We are at ease with ourselves. That is the journey back. So the process, the process of getting back to that state of oneness, as well as the state of oneness itself. So both the process, as well as the state, and the tools, the methodologies that enable us to get back to that state. Well, all of them are nothing but yoga. When we want to understand the history of yoga, it is useful to look at it from a point of view which has three components. A time frame where there is a three frames in that bigger time frame. Now when we talk about time in Indian culture, we are talking about the yugas which are huge time cycles. And time is not linear but it is cyclic or rather spiraling upwards from the Indian standpoint. The first time frame would be what we would call prehistoric. So this prehistoric, which is primarily the Vedic period. The Vedic period is what we would refer here as prehistoric. We then have the second, the historic period where we have the transmission of teachings from master to disciple, guru to shishya, the guru shishya parampara. It could be both the oral and the written. And then we come to the third time frame, which is the modern, which is where we are now on this cusp of the explosion of yoga everywhere, everywhere. So let's get back to it. We have the prehistoric, which is often called the Vedic period. And this is sort of the antiquity of time in which the seeds of yoga were planted. When we look at the Vedas, we have the four Vedas in Indian culture. The Rig Veda, the most ancient teachings of humanity, which basically are hymns to nature. Because the yogis were the original green people. They were the environmentalists. They believed in conserving nature. They respected nature and they worshipped nature. So in this period, you have the Rig Veda, the most ancient teachings of humanity. And that is where you start to have the first seeds that then through the Yajur Veda, which is where all the practices come in. How do you do things? And then comes the next one, which is the Sama Veda. The Sama Veda where the vibrational essence was understood and the origin of music and what we would call Nada Yoga. Of course, there is the fourth Veda, which is the new kid on the block from the Vedic standpoint, Atharvana Veda. 
The Atharmana Veda is actually where you start to find the origins of what today is called Tantra. So Tantra, Yantra, all of these, the origins are more Atharvana Veda. Mantra, of course, Rig Veda, Yajur Veda, and Nara Yoga, the Sama Veda. Now, where do these Vedas lie in the time frame? Well, a minimum of 10,000 years ago. That's a minimum. But what has happened is most of the Indologists who studied India, they had such a limited perspective of time that it was blowing the mind to think that there could be people who had cultures such as the Sanatana Dharma Indian culture so long ago. And hence people tried to keep the Vedas 1500, 2000 BC and all. Well, we now definitely know that at least 10,000 years back we are talking about the Vedic culture. And that Vedic culture is where the seed of yoga is found. Now you may ask me, well Dr. Ananda, where are the yoga asanas, where is the Surya Namaskar, where are all the Shat Karmas in the Vedas? Yes, they are not there. Because yoga does not lie in the practices alone. Yoga is all life. And hence, when we understand the physiology, the psychology and the philosophy of yoga, we understand the physics and the metaphysics of yoga, we start to realize how the seeds of yoga are found in the Vedic culture. In those days, the teachings were from guru to shishya, master to disciple. So the master to disciple teachings were oral. O-R-A-L and A-U-R-A-L. Right? Both have the same pronunciation. Oral and oral. Because it was from the mouth of the guru to the ears of the student. Karna Parampara we call it. Through the hearing. Because our Vedic culture was based on hearing these vibrations. Perceiving the higher vibrations through the process of Shabda. So we talk about Shabda Brahman. The cosmos, which is our vibrational essence. And that is why when we talk about the Vedas, we talk about the Shruti, that which was heard. Then it was put into memory and it became Smriti. So the Shruti part is the first part, then comes the Smriti. Now in those days, it was primarily the Guru would chant and the student would chant. And this is how the transmission occurred. And this type of transmission was a transmission that was a living transmission. Living transmission. And the student spent years and years, decades with the master. Not like in modern times where we have 200 hours yoga teacher certification and weekend courses. It was decades of a person's life were devoted to the learning because it's learning about life. Yoga is life. So you're learning about life lessons through yoga. How to approach life. What is life? What is my place in the bigger picture of things? And hence, this was a period where the origin of the Vedas being lost in antiquity, a time when the Gurukula, the hermit ages of the Gurus, the great masters in the forests, where they lived yoga as a 24-hour sadhana, not something you do 20 minutes a day or 45 minutes on a yoga mat. It is something which is a 24-hour sadhana. And this is why we find Rig Veda, Yajur Veda, Atharva Veda and the Sama Veda. In all of them, we find the roots of yoga that are lying there. Even the roots of the concept of Surya Namaskar come from that time where there was the worship of the Surya. The sun was perceived as a manifestation of the divine. One of the best manifestations to identify with, to offer our gratitude, our respect, our obeisance. Now from this Vedic time, which was prehistoric, we came into the historic time. And this historic time is where things started to get written down. And this is the period where we have 
the amazing Itihasas, the Itihasas which are the epics of India, the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. People often forget that the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, they are actually giving us the essence of a yogic way of life. Numerous stories are there, numerous examples are there of what it is to be living in tune with humanity. How to be a noble human being? Because ultimately, a yogi is nobody but a noble human being. Once upon a time, we were, you know, the Homo erectus, then we became Homo sapiens, then we became Homo sapiens sapien. Now the next stage, Homo nobilis. What is it to be a noble human being? That is what yoga is helping us understand. And the Ramayana Mahabharata are excellent examples for all these teachings of yoga. The psychology of yoga, the philosophy of yoga, the metaphysics of yoga, all brought into a story form, in a day-to-day -day relatable form for easier digestion. Veda Vyasa, the codifier, of the Vedas is also the author, well he had Lord Ganesha as his scribe, the composer of the Mahabharata and the great Valmiki, Ratnakara who transformed his life through the Mantra Japa of the Ramanama. He gives us the Ramayana. What beautiful stories of how every human soul, every human soul, that Atma can overcome the lower passions that are associated with the lower animal nature and enable us to transform ourselves into that inherent divinity. As Swami Vivekananda often said, every soul is potentially divine. And these itihasas, they give us the basis of how this can happen. Within the Mahabharata has the most important of the yogic scriptures, the Bhagavad Gita, the Srimad Bhagavad Gita, which are the teachings of Yogeshwar Krishna to his disciple Arjuna. And where were the teachings given? On the battlefield of the Kurukshetra. The Pandavas, the good guys on one side, the Kauravas, the bad guys on the other. And Krishna and Arjuna come in the chariot to the center and Arjuna goes into turmoil. He has a panic attack. Arjuna Vishada Yoga is the first chapter. The Yoga of the Dejection of Arjuna is the first chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, the first of the 18. And Lord Krishna, Yogeshwar Krishna, the pure consciousness in human form, guides Arjuna out of the turmoil. From that breakdown, from that breakdown, he moves into a breakthrough. My father, Swami Gitananda Giri, used to often say, a breakdown is often an opportunity for a spiritual breakthrough to occur. And this is the best example where Lord Krishna, the divine consciousness, is guiding Arjuna. The Srimad Bhagavad Gita is often said to be a Hindu scripture. I always say it is a yogic scripture. The teachings of yoga, the pinnacle teachings of yoga, are brought out. Karma Yoga, Jnana Yoga, Bhakti Yoga are brought out in the teachings of the Bhagavad Gita where the examples, such beautiful concepts, Yoga as Samatvam, as harmonious, balanced, equipoise, equanimity, manifesting physiologically in homeostatic balance. Samatvam, Yoga Uchati, a beautiful definition of Yoga that is found in the Bhagavad Gita. Another one, every action you do, when you do it skillfully, it becomes yoga. Yoga ha karma sukaushanam. What beautiful teachings of yoga as a way of life. One of the most important aspects we need to take to heart is yoga is a way of life. How to bring that karma sukaushanam, that beautiful skill and action into each and every aspect of our life. How to maintain equanimity when there are the imbalances between the opposites, the bipolar opposites which are part of the universe. Siddhya, Asiddhya, some days we succeed, some days we don't succeed. 
Some things are hot, some are cold, some are good, some are bad. Sometimes we are praised, sometimes we are, well, blamed. How do you maintain balance? Siddhya, Siddha yo samabhutva. Samatvam yoga uchate, says Lord Krishna. He also gives amazing concept about how one needs to prepare for dhyana. Sitting erect with a well-aligned spine and contemplating the midpoint between the eyebrows or the tip of the nose. Working on the inhalation and the exhalation. Letting the prana move into the apana and the apana move into the prana. Lifting the self by the self. When you know yourself, the self is your best friend. And when you don't know yourself, the self is your worst enemy. Amazing teachings are brought through the 700 verses of the Bhagavad Gita where at least more than 100 verses are directly linked to the teachings of yoga. And this is why it is important to understand this. These were not given in some cave when everybody was quiet and tranquil. These were given in the middle of the battlefield because life is often a battlefield and we feel like we are in the middle of it. Caught between the extremes. Whether to go right or go left, go up or go down. Well, Krishna, the pure consciousness is guiding us, Arjuna. And he reminds Arjuna, be thou a yogi. Tapas vibhyo adhiko yogi jnanibhyo abhimado adhika. Karma bhyas chadiko yogi tasmad yogi bhava Arjuna. Thou become a yogi, Arjuna. He is not just telling Arjuna, he is telling each and every one of us. What beautiful teachings come through thanks to such a wonderful scripture. Similarly, we find another scripture, Yoga Vashishta, which is the first recorded counseling session in human history where Sage Vashishta, who is the high priest of the kingdom, which is ruled by Rama's father, Dasharatha, and the king tells the high priest, the Kula Guru, Vashishta, he says, please counsel my son. He is going through the despondency of teenage. He is in turmoil. And sage Vashishta gives this beautiful counseling session. Yoga Vashishta. Story within story within story within story. And in that, we find the basis of even yoga therapy. Understanding Adija Vyadi and Anadija Vyadi, the psychosomatic and the non psychosomatic disorders are described in the Yoga Vashishta. Now, how long ago was that? Well, in our Indian calendar, we are about 5,100 plus years into what is called Kali Yuga. I told you the Yugas are there. Yes, Kali Yuga. When was the first day of Kali Yuga? Often it is said to be the first day of the Mahabharata. Some people say the day Krishna died, but first day of Mahabharata, it's all close by. So, 5,100 plus years we are into Kali Yuga, which means the Mahabharata is historically in Indian culture dated at least 5,000 years ago and the Rama Avatara precedes Krishna Avatara. So, at least a couple of thousand years before that. So, Yoga Vashishta, at least 7,000 years ago we are talking about it. And when we talk about Bhagavad Gita and the Mahabharata, at least 5,000 years. Mind-boggling. Mind-boggling. And that is why one has to open a new perspective. And otherwise, we will not understand these teachings. Because these are timeless teachings. Similarly, we find that from the Vedas, the abstracts, the extracts from the Vedas came out in the form of the Upanishads. Upanishad means that, you know, where, which you get sitting next to your teacher. And this became another of the darshanas, the perspectives called Vedanta. Veda Anta, the end part of the Vedas. Now, many of these Upanishads may be 3000 years ago, 5000 years ago, and a bit more recent compared to that. They explain the high Vedic concepts in a more simpler way and it is like you are reading the abstract rather than the whole article. Very, very beautiful Upanishads are there. And 
these Upanishads, such as the Katha Upanishad, Katha Upanishad is the discussion between the god of death, Yama Dharma Raja, and a young boy, Nachiketa. And it is an amazing teaching of the yogic concepts which are found there. They talk about the nadis, 101 nerves, the nadis in the heart, and one going up to the head. And if we can go through that, we attain immortality. Beautiful concepts are there. Similarly, Upanishads like the Prasna Upanishad by the Guru, Pipalada, with his six students, and where he brings in the concept of prana as the mother-father of all created things, the moment between the creator and the created. Beautiful concepts are brought into the Prasna Upanishad. Similarly, we find the Mundaka Upanishad, where, where there's a beautiful uh, question from a seeker. It says, Master, what is that which when known, one knows all? What is that which when known, one knows all? What a beautiful question that a seeker is asking the Guru. And the sage Angiras, the Rishi, he gives the stress on meditation, dhyana, on the pranava. And this is where the concept of the pranava comes in. The omkara, the ah, oh, um, coming in. Which again you find in the Chandogya Upanishad. So you find the Mundaka Upanishad, you find the Prasna Upanishad, the Chandogya Upanishad, which talks about the importance of the omkara, the pranava. And this is, this is something that we need to understand that the pranava, which is the Om, is not limited to the Hindu culture. The Om, A -O -M, in the Indian tradition, is the Amen, Amin, in different other traditions. Because this was a perspective that expanded so wide, it could encompass all the perspectives. It was one of openness. Vasudaiva Kudumbakam. The whole world is one family. Imagine you move from any sense of duality because the whole world is one family. We are one. The Brahadaranyaka Upanishad, the largest Upanishad. We have sage Yajna Valkya, another very important personality in the yoga tradition, where he talks about the concept of Shravana, Manana, and Nididhyasana. Shravana means to hear, to listen. So first you have to listen to the teachings. Manana, you have to take it to mind. You have to contemplate it. You have to chew the cud. And then Nididhyasana, you have to be established in it. What beautiful concepts are brought out. And again, Shvetasvatha Upanishad, where the concept of moksha, liberation, only being attained when your heart is pure. The purity of heart is so important there. All of these Upanishads, they are stressing on devotion, dedication, service, seva, austerity, truthfulness, continence, self-restraint, faith and generosity. And it is such a beautiful concept because these are qualities that make us a noble human being. And that is what yoga is supposed to do. And it's not about bringing your blood pressure down or bringing your blood sugar down. Those are the side benefits of yoga. What is the main goal? It is to enhance our growth from a subhuman to the human to the humane and finally divine aspects of our existence. Such beautiful teachings are found in all of these Upanishads. And this is where then we go on to understand that these teachings are then brought together so beautifully by Maharishi Patanjali. Maharishi Patanjali, at least 2500 years ago, according to tradition, at least 2500 years ago, codifies all of these teachings in the Yoga Darshana through his Yoga Sutra. A science of spirituality, a time traveler, Maharishi Patanjali, his teachings are as relevant today as they were 2500 years ago. And I tell you, 
they will be still relevant 2000 years from now because he is a time traveler. And what beautiful teachings, the four Padas, starting off with the Samadhi Pada. What is this concept of absorption? Sadhana Pada, how do you get there? Wherein he lays the basis of the first five, the Bahiranga Yoga, through the Yama, Niyama, Asana, Pranayama and Pratyahara. And then coming to the next one, the Vibhuti Pada, where the inner aspects, what are called Sanyama, the Sanyama Yoga, Dharana, Dhyana, Samadhi, and all the siddhis that are attained through Samyama, the power of the mind, the power of a focused mind. Like the light which is all scattered, is brought together into a single beam in the laser. The mind is brought together, having amazing capabilities, the Vibhuti Pada. And then, of course, the ultimate goal of all of this is Kaivalya, called liberation, where basically you are back at where you were. We move away from that and we move back to it. Just like the drop coming out of the ocean and going back into the ocean. What beautiful teachings are there? And through this, the teachings of the Ashtanga Yoga, which is the foundation if one is to live a life of yoga. The Yama, the five Yamas, enabling us to restrain the subhuman tendencies. The five Niyamas, Enabling us to grow into the humane qualities, strengthening the body through asana, understanding the energies through the pranayama, restraining the senses through pratyahara, and then we are ready to focus the mind in dharana, and then we move into that beautiful state of meditation, dhyana, and as we go deeper into it, a state of absorption, samadhi. He also gives us the teachings of Kriya Yoga, Tapas, Swadhyaya, Ishvara, Pranidhana, discipline, self-analysis, self-reflection and the capacity to give over to the higher perspective. These are so vital if we are to eradicate all the malware in our system, which are called the kleshas, the impurities that distort our perspective and create stress. Kriya Yoga of Maharishi Patanjali, Ashtanga Yoga of Maharishi Patanjali. Concepts like Pratipaksha Bhavanam, adopting the contrary perspective. What beautiful teachings by this master psychologist. He is a master psychologist. When you understand Patanjali, wow, nobody has understood the human mind and beyond better than him. Now, after this, you have so many different teachings coming in. The Brahma Sutra, the Upanishads, the Bhagavad Gita is there. Adi Shankara comes and you have all of this going on. And then suddenly around 580, the shift in yoga occurred from this higher metaphysical, philosophical, psychological aspect to a more physically focused aspect. And this is where from about 580 to 1580, in that period, we have what is called the Hatha scriptures coming in. Goraksha, Shatakam, Gheranda Samhita and the Hatha Yoga Pradipika to name three of the important. Rishi Goraksha gives us the Goraksha Shatakam, 100 verses. And he gives us the concept of six limbs of yoga. Shadanga Yoga. So Goraksha gives us six limbs. Asana, Pranayama, Pratyahara, Dharana, Dhyana, Samadhi. He has left out Yama, Niyama. So people say, I don't have to practice it. No, what Goraksha meant is, you already had the Yama, Niyama and then only you came to yoga. Otherwise, you would not start the practice. Um, but people think, oh, that's the easy way out. And the concept of 84 lakh asanas, 8.4 million asanas starts to come in at this point. Uh, you know, the Shiva Samhita, the Goraksha Shatakam, this is where these type of numbers started to come in. And then the asana, Siddha Asana being the most important, starts to be focused in these scriptures. They talk about 72 Nadis, subtle energy channels, with three most important. The Shushumna down the center, the Pingala on the right, and the Ida on the left. These concepts start to come in. And the concept of Kundalini is also brought out in Goraksha's teachings. 
The Gananda Samhita brings another concept because here the concept of baking the pot, Gatastha Yoga, and the concept is that we need to be fit to hold the divine in us. The pot has to be well baked to hold anything without getting destroyed. That concept is brought in here. And he brings in what is called Saptanga Yoga. So Goraksha was Shadanga Yoga, six limbs. Here Garanda Rishi gives us Saptanga Yoga, seven. Maharishi Patanjali, Ashtanga, eight. And here you have the concept where that one has to work on to the Kriyas. These are the preliminary practices to clean the impurities so that the subtle channels are open and the energy of the prana can flow. We then have the concept of Vasana, Mudra, Pratyahara, Pranayama, Dhyana and Samadhi are there. And we find that Rishi Garanda, he gives us 32 asanas. Again, always you will find the Siddhasana as being the most important one then. Siddhasana, Padmasana, Badrasana, you find them. He talks of the mudras, 25 mudras also. And you then come later to the Hatha Pradipika, where you have a very, very different approach. Because here suddenly you have 15 asanas instead of 32. And the Ashta Kumbhaka, this is where this concept of the eight pranayamas comes in. Pranayamas are called Kumbhaka here because you are holding the prana in like something being held in a pot. Water in a pot, you are holding something and protecting it because that is where you understand the life force which is prana. And the four most important asanas, Siddhasana, Padmasana, Simma and Badrasana are brought out. The most important mudra, Kechari mudra is brought out. The most important Nadi, Sushumna Nadi, you know, these type of concepts start to come uh, into these teachings. And the concept of the purification, the Shat Karma, Dauti, Basti, Neti, Trataka, Nauli, and Kapalabhati, all of these start to come in. But he makes a beautiful statement. If you look at the Hatha Pradipika, one cannot attain perfection in Raja Yoga without Hatha Yoga. And you cannot attain perfection in Hatha Yoga without Raja Yoga. So you need both the Hatha Yoga and the Raja Yoga. This balance is so important. It is well brought out uh, in this concept here. We then find that all of these teachings, the Hatha teachings, focusing on different asanas, the mudras, the bandhas, the use of the nadis, the pranayamas are all brought in. And these teachings started to continue. Now, when we talk about these scriptures, one has to always keep in mind that everything was not written down in Indian culture. And second thing is that which was written down was never meant to be an instruction manual. It was more like class notes. You know, when somebody is going to give a lecture, they make a few notes. These may have been more like class notes that are surviving. And again, so many of the scriptures have been destroyed along the way. So to say that, oh, if it's only in this scripture, it is yoga, I think is not a good position to take. We need to be open that yoga is much bigger than any book. Books are good. As my professor Madan Mohanji used to say, books are for the obedience of the fools and for the guidance of the wise. We need to be wise and understand that we have to expand things. Because these teachings were protected, they were valued and hence they were protected and not just spread indiscriminately. The student had to be worthy to be given the teachings. And so many of these scriptures remind us, keep the teachings secret, value the teachings and only give them when the student is ready for them. So when we say, oh, it's in that book and I'm going to teach it and I'm going to do it, we need to sort of take a step back and relook our attitude towards these teachings. Well, we now come to the third part, yoga and modern times. Where do you start this? <laughs> well, I think the easiest is September 11, 1893, when Swami Vivekananda, the monk from the East, went and gave that beautiful speech at the World Parliament of Religions in Chicago. My brothers and sisters of America. And suddenly 
the door opened for the window and so many, so many of the great masters, then the teaching started to go to the West. We can see that that period 1893 to 1920, Swami Vivekananda and his own guru, Ramakrishna Paramahamsa, a realized master. Ramana Maharishi down here at Tiruvannamalai, the saint of the mountain. Once when Ramana was asked, which is the best asana? He answered, Nidhi Dhyasana. You remember Shravana listening, Manana contemplating Nidhi Dhyasana to be established in that which you have learned. Right? To be established in the reality of that final learning. That is the best asana. What a beautiful play on words. Of course, Lahari Mahasaya. And through that, coming into the traditions, so many came later. And Kanakananda Bhrigu, to whom our own tradition owes its allegiance. The period of 1920 to 1960, another 40 years, Lahari Mahasaya's Shishya, Swami Yogananda. He from Bengal goes to California and takes North America by storm. I don't think there are too many people in yoga today who haven't read the autobiography of a yogi. It has been a book that has brought more people to yoga than anything else. We have the great philosopher Jiddu Krishnamurti at Chennai. Swami Shivananda from Kerala who settled in Rishikesh and then the Divine Life Society and all his students who went so many parts of the world, be it Swami Satyananda or be it Swami Vishnu Devananda, all into different parts. Swami Sachidananda who went to the USA and on the other side you have Sri Krishnamacharya, who from Mysore, his students then come into it. And on the other side, you have Swami Kovalainanda and Sri Yogendra Desai, both coming from Madhav Das Ji. So the parampara of Madhav Das Ji coming into Sri Yogendra Desai and Yogendra Ji, the Yoga Institute of Santa Cruz in Mumbai. Swami Kuvalainanda, Kaivalya Dhamma in Mumbai and then in Lonavla. Swami Shivananda, Divine Life Society, the Bihar School of Yoga. And then down in you know, the south of India in Nair Dham, we have the Vishnu Devananda's tradition continuing. From Swami Kanakananda, Swami Gitananda, who at that time was in Vancouver and still known as Ananda Bhavanani. And one of Sri Krishnamacharya's most important Western disciples, Indra Devi, from Russia, who finally settled in South America. Sri Krishnamacharya had his own different disciples, who from the 1960s to present time, we find their impact. Yogacharya Sri B.K. Sayangar, we find Sri Patabi Joyce, and Sri T.K.V. Deshikachar. All three of them coming out of the lineage of Krishnamacharya. Swami Gitananda Giri settling in Pondicherry and his tradition being continued through Ammaji and myself now. Swami Vishnu Devananda going to Canada with the teachings of Shivananda. Swami Sachidananda founding Yoga Bill in USA. Amit Desai who founded Kripalu. Similarly, after Yogendra Ji, we had Jaydev Ji, Hansa Ji, Swami Rama of the Himalayas, who again in the USA showcased the power of yoga by stopping his heart and so many other changes in temperature across the limbs. And the Himalayan tradition continuing through the work in the USA as well as the work of Swami Veda Bharati and the association in Rishikesh. Sri Dhirendra Brahmachari, he at one time was the big yogi of India. He was the yoga guru to our first Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru 
and Srimadhi Indra Gandhi. And his ashram today is the National Institute for Yoga, Moraji Desai National Institute for Yoga in Delhi. Now after this, we at the other side have also had Mahesh, Mahesh Yogi with the transcendental meditation, getting the beetles involved and automatically catching fire all around the world with 20 minutes of your own individual japa as a meditative technique. And at the same time, in the last few decades, amazing work happening through Svyasa in Bangalore under Guruji Nagendraji along with Didi Nagaratnaji. The work of Pooja Swamiji Ramdev Maharaj with the Patanjali feet in Haridwar. The work of the art of living through Sri Sri Ravi Shankarji in Bangalore. The wonderful work of Sri Daji and the heartfulness movement in Hyderabad and in Coimbatore, the Isha movement through Sadhguru Jagi Vasudev. All of these have been growing over the last few decades. And today, yoga is moving nook and corner of the world. The government of India first had a department of Ayush and then it became a ministry of Ayush in which yoga finds a place. We now have since 2015 the International Day of Yoga on June 21. And all of these events are part of that 100 days to June 21. So many recent developments, yoga as a therapy, yoga coming into universities, yoga as yoga asana sport, now getting recognition. Wonderful work over the last 50 years that now sees yoga asana sport as a recognized sport by the government of India hoping for it to even reach the Olympics. So many growth and developments happening in the field of yoga from the prehistoric, the historic and the modern times. I hope through this short lecture, you have got a glimpse of what this big history is all about. Yoga is indeed timeless. And through yoga, we move from being a limited finite individual into that infinite, unlimited universality. That is the beautiful message of yoga. And I wish that each and every one of us brings yoga into our life. Let it be 24 hour mindful living and may we keep growing and glowing in the spirit of yoga. That is my prayer for all of us. Hari Om Tatsat, Danyavadaha, Namaste.